Crown has decided that from this day forward, trial by combat will be forbidden throughout the Seven Kingdoms. This moment is a, a grievous blow for Cersei because she's been counting on trial by combat really since the end of season five. This was always her ace in the hole. The mountain was never gonna lose a trial by combat. There's no one out there who could, who could beat him. And then Tommen takes it away from her. And knowing really what he's doing, he might be a weak king, but he's not an idiot. You know, he understands that this move is, to me, that she's probably not gonna fare that well in this trial. So it's a pretty devastating moment for Cersei, and you see that in her reaction, and partly because it's just bodes so ill for this coming trial, and partly because it's her own son who's really betrayed her. Seven blessings, Wolf. Well. You know, he's in a tough position where he has to do what he thinks is right, and um, unfortunately for Cersei, what he thinks is right in this moment is doing something which is very much against Cersei's interests. My name is Brienne of Tarth. Please inform Sir Jamie Lannister I've come to speak with him. Jamie didn't expect to see Brienne necessarily ever again. He certainly didn't expect to see her marching into his military camp. And his relationship with her is obviously very complicated and fraught and has undercurrents that he's uncomfortable with feeling. You gave it to me for a purpose. I have achieved that purpose. Giving her this the Valyrian steel sword is, is, was no small thing. There are probably like 10 of these things in the world. It's yours. It will always be yours. He's given it to her, not not to carry out one task or for one stretch of time, but for the rest of her life. I think that's a, a symbolic, meaningful gesture on his part. And yet, here she's honor bound to point out that they're not on the same side in this fight, and that if it turns to a real fight, they may end up having to actually fight one another. It's these two who are not quite sure of how they feel about the other, and he lets her go. You know, he'd, he'd be well within his rights to send his men after her to capture her, and it wouldn't be that hard to capture her since she's being slowly rowed away by, by Podrick, but he doesn't. She might technically be an enemy now that she's serving Sansa Stark, who is still obviously a suspect in Joffrey's murder, but she's not Jamie's enemy. So uh, he's letting her go, and she knows that he's letting her go, and uh, you know, who knows if they'll ever see each other again. Arya is in danger. She's got an open wound in her stomach, and the one person who has protected her to this point, unfortunately, gets murdered. The many-faced god was promised a name. He must always receive what is his. And now he's been promised another name. The fact that the many-faced god gets the people who have been promised to him really makes you think that there's just almost an inevitability about what happens to people who run afoul of the Faceless Men, as Arya has done. It will all be over soon. <laughs> Getting to the, the final part of the sequence, Arya's telling Jockin by putting the face on the wall that this, this account is settled and we're good here and now I'm gonna walk away and I think she knows what the answer is gonna be. Finally, a girl is no one. The implication is obviously that Jockin on, on some level was, was rooting for the outcome that he got he may be no one, but there's still enough of a person left in him to respect and admire who this girl is and what she's become. Arya finally tells us something that we've kind of known all along. She's not no one. She's Arya Stark of Winterfell. Winterfell.